is good to greet you this morning. Although it is through a medium, we did not anticipate even as recent as this Thursday. The elders deliberated and did not arrive at this decision lightly. The gathering of the saints is precious and it is a demonstration to the world of whom we belong to. And gathering together in a time of difficulty is a profoundly unifying and faith-bolstering moment. Those who are prone to anxiousness and fear need to hear of the greatness of God and sing His praises with the redeemed. And so to cancel the service of worship unto our Lord is something we did not decide lightly. But we live under authority and in an effort to honor the direction and guidance of our health and governmental officials, we decided to listen to their concern and warnings. Even though they did not mandate our canceling, we chose to act out of love for our neighbor and respect for those the Lord has placed over us. The government is not forcing us to shut down out of some defiance to God, but they've asked us to show caution. They've asked us to show caution in order to physically protect those citizens under their care. We thought it wise and good to honor their God-ordained position. However, as your spiritual leaders, we have been given a unique opportunity to shepherd and lead you through this time of uncertainty. And we do not want to waste it. So I am excited to greet you this morning. We want to help your families think and respond biblically during this time of uncertainty. In a few moments, I will speak to you and deliver you a combination of a fireside chat slash sermon in order to provide direction in how you might respond and how you might praise the Lord during this time. But Jesse has also kindly come this morning and he's come to help lead you and your family in the singing of a couple songs and then I will speak to you from God's word. Thank you, brother. Tribes of every tongue, a new discovered grace demands a new and nobler song.
Thank you, brother. We trust that your soul is encouraged and bolstered already this morning through the singing of songs together. Well, it is at this time, if you and your children would like to take advantage of our children's church, all children ages four, just kidding, you are not allowed to dismiss your children. Hopefully you have gathered your children around and are watching this all together as a family. Uh, we have to have some fun with this. This is uh, new territory for us, and even making light of it, I think, joins us together in a uh, measure of humor. But I am going to ask you to bow with me for a word of prayer. I am going to be opening up God's word, and I'm going to ask for his guidance to be uh, with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is good and right to even gather this morning. This is your day, even in this unique opportunity, unique situation uh, Lord, I pray that you will gather the souls of your saints together, and we will be unified in the worship of our Lord and Savior, our great and sovereign God. Even now, as I open up your word, I pray that it will bring comfort to those who need comfort. It will bring conviction, that it will settle the hearts of the anxious as we look to you, Father. Will you bless your word? and its proclamation. In Jesus' name, amen. It is unescapable, whether you read the newspapers, are looking at online news clips, or watching the news from a TV source, lessons are being given. And they don't seem to stop being given. It seems every conversation that I am in, somebody has a word of advice about the coronavirus. We've received, I've received personally instruction on a broad level. We need to stop being so dependent on China. That's what this coronavirus has taught us. Pharmaceuticals, technological widgets. We're so dependent on this foreign power, this foreign deceptive power. We need to learn from this moment to cut off that dependence. We need to stop relying on foreign energy. And from the international to the domestic instruction that we receive, every family should have an emergency plan. We need to wash our hands and then wash them again and maybe even a third time for no shorter than 20 seconds at each session. And then maybe the word of advice that seems to be have received by most people and most vigorously is to buy as much toilet paper as possible possible. It has been a rare conversation these days where I have not received some instruction on what I should do to protect myself, my family, and this church. I never knew there were so many epi I gotta get this word right. Epi epidemiologists. Did I get that right? Among us. But whether the lessons are on an international level or a domestic level regarding our families, there are indeed lessons to be had that are far more profound than the pundits and the politicians and even the doctors would have us to learn. Job 36 verse 15 says this, that he delivers the afflicted by their affliction and he opens their ear by adversity. Or as C.S. Lewis, maybe he didn't know this, but he was summarizing the truth of Job 36, 15, when he wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pains. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Wisdom is secured when we reflect upon our mortality. And maybe if this event, this, I think, historical event has taught us anything, it has reminded us of our mortality. Well, in the time that I have your attention now, I would like to lead us through eight different lessons that are to be learned at this moment. One, God is sovereign. 
two, God is not opposed to our suffering. Three, God is good. Four, the Lord is with us. We do not need to fear. Five, we are frail. Six, we are dependent. Seven, that which is eternal cannot be touched. And number eight, we are responsible to act, and it is loving to do so. Well, number one, a lesson that I think we need to learn or maybe be reminded of at this time is that God is sovereign. That's nothing new. It's more of a reminder, but we need to hear it once again. Our comfort, congregation, is not in knowing more about COVID-19, but our comfort is in knowing more about our Lord. Hosea 6.3 actually puts it in those exact words. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. In our times of uncertainty, we don't need to know more about COVID-19. We need to know more about our Lord. Daniel, in a prophetic fashion, says the same things regarding that era of deception that will come upon the land. He prophesies that there is going to be a great deceiver that will deceive the people. He says this in Daniel 11.32, He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. You don't need to know more of the circumstances that surround us. We need to know more of our God. And He is sovereign. What a waste of this moment if we spend every waking moment studying the spread of a virus and cease to grow in our knowledge of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 in verse 39 speaks of our God that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath there is no other Joshua chapter 2 verse 11 repeats that same notion and as soon as we heard it our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you then it says this For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. We know that the highest heavens above and the earth beneath all belong to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 47 verse 2 bolsters our confidence with this truth. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared. He is a great king over all the earth. Psalm 89 verse 11 continues, and and we could go on and on, but it says this, The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it you have found in them. God is sovereign. And His sovereign purposes are coming together as He directs all the events of the universe to accomplish His own plan. Brethren, God has not lost control. His dominion is forever. Nothing has removed God from His throne, as 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 to 16 remind us. And maybe you're like Isaiah in the day that, or in the year that King Uzziah died, where what appeared to be a great and overwhelming calamity, a king that the nation was able to trust in, a king that, that feared the Lord and provided wealth and abundance for his people. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah was given a vision in Isaiah 6 1, and he saw the Lord high and lifted 
up. And maybe in this moment, we need to have our eyes high and lifted up, as it were. We need to remind ourselves that God is sovereign, and that powerful truth maybe is is like a, a little fist under our chin that can raise our eyes upward instead of having them merely hovering here, looking about in fear as to what is next. God is sovereign. We must not forget that. Second, we also must remind ourselves that God is not opposed to our suffering. Our suffering and God's sovereignty actually coexist. God and Satan are not in some cosmic battle where some days Satan wins and it rains and some days God wins and it brings sunshine. Now one day, God's power will be demonstrated in the banishment of all that is evil and wicked. But in this day, He even allows evil and sicknesses and diseases and suffering of all levels and varieties for the accomplishment of His great purposes. We see it on a grand scale. We can see it even on an individual scale. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, I have a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. I asked the Lord three times that He would remove it. But what does the Lord say? My grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. In that moment, God wanted Paul to be in pain for a greater and more ultimate purpose. In a sense, God's response was, I have chosen for you to be in distress. I have chosen for you to be in calamity. Because it's at that point that you run out of your human resources. And when we have no human resources left, where else are we going to turn? In a sense, God is saying, you're going to turn to me. And you're going to see firsthand, not just on a cosmic level, not just on a universal level, but you are going to see in a personal, firsthand way that in your weakness, my grace is perfected. So Paul could say, most gladly then, I will boast in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I am well content with weakness. I am well content with insults. I am well content with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In the days ahead, we may experience this weakness on a personal level. But isn't it good to know that God doesn't need our strength. He doesn't need our power. He doesn't need our ingenuity. But He can even use our weaknesses to exalt His name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, and maybe 2 Corinthians 1 is the chapter that you and your family will find most precious during this time of uncertainty. But 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9 says, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Listen, God is sovereign, but God is not opposed to our suffering. And even in the life of the great apostle Paul, who we think maybe had arrived spiritually from the moment that he was saved, he still needed calamity, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 says, to cause him to rely not on himself, but upon his God. Don't think it's a matter of spiritual weakness that you've grown um, anxious or, or fearful in this time. But we are to take that anxiety and that fear and, and see that it is a way that God is causing us to rely on Him. What a unique way that He is pursuing us at this time. God is not opposed to our suffering 
but we also must be reminded of the goodness of God. God has not given creation over to wickedness and chaos and disorder. Maybe we're reminded of the potential of the destruction of sin during this time that viruses and diseases and infections would run wild were it not for God's steady and staid hand. He uses it all to accomplish His perfect will. This virus, I think, has, has demonstrated and has taught us how much the Lord actually restrains. The fact that there is predictability in our world. The fact that the sun rises each and every day. The fact that the oceans stop where they do. is a demonstration that God is good. Job 38 verses 8 to 11 actually picks up on this same thought. Who shut in the sea with doors, God says to Job, when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. We owe it to the goodness of God that this world has not been given over to complete chaos and turmoil. His hand stays the potential destruction of natural forces and disease. Were he not active, sin and destruction would be the norm and not the exception. He causes the daylight to push back the darkness. Job continues... The dawn of the day is a reminder that the wicked will not always rule, Job 38, verses 12 and 13. Darkness will one day give way to day forever and ever. But in Psalm 46, 5, the psalmist reminds the redeemed, God will help her when morning dawns. The darkness always gives way to the morning. Lesson four, the Lord is with us. We do not need to fear. I can say that at some level, fear is inevitable. And it's often yet unpredictable. But how we handle fear is not inevitable. And it can be predictable. One writer described fear as the reaction of mind and body as it furiously attempts to control the uncontrollable. I think that's worth repeating. Fear is the reaction of mind and body as it furiously attempts to control the uncontrollable. We are told over 300 times in Scripture, do not And we need to hear that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Sometimes that it is in those moments of suffering, it is in those moments of turmoil, that we feel the presence of the Lord most closely. I think that's what the psalmist wants us to gather from the way he writes Psalm 23. I've made this observation before, but it's fitting to remind you again. I'm going to read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in path of righteousness for His name's sake. But when we get to the valley of the shadow of death, He becomes you as the Lord is now beside the psalms. It's not third person, it's second person. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Do you catch what the psalmist wants us to catch in those times of weakness, in those times of uncertainty, in those times of the shadow of death? He becomes you. He is near us. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul would 
say as he faced his tormentors and even faced the moment of his death, that he would not fear, for the Lord would deliver him. Writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. What an interesting thought, that he endured persecutions and sufferings and trial, and yet he still considered to be rescued by the Lord. But down in verse 17, we see the greater vision of Paul. It's almost kind of a pathetic and sad verse, chapter 4, verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What does it mean for the Lord to rescue Paul? Was not to be set free from death, set free from the courtroom, set free from attacks and persecution. It was to be ushered into his heavenly kingdom. Oh, the Lord is near to those who fear Him. And His deliverance is better than temporary relief. Dear saints, His deliverance for you is eternal. For who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He who did not spare His own Son, Paul would write in Romans 8, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God is with us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. He has not destined us for wrath. 1 John 4, 19. Perfect love casts out fear. We no longer fear judgment, but we know that God is doing all things to accomplish his perfect will in our hearts and in our lives. And so we can say with the psalmist, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, we will not fear. God is with us. God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he's not opposed to trial and suffering. And God is a good God. The Lord is with us. We do not need to fear. Oh, this virus has also taught us that we are frail. And we need to be reminded of our weakness and vulnerability in order to rest completely on God. I'll remind you of that verse I read earlier, 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. That through calamity, through difficulty, Paul, through being reminded of his frailty, Paul was caused to rely on God. When calamity comes, we stop relying on human resources. All this talk about uh, the incubation period of this virus is a reminder that maybe we truly don't know how we are doing when people ask us, how are you doing? We answer politely, oh, I'm doing fine. Things are good. But in reality, you could be a vector. You could be a host. Only God knows how we are doing. And there is something immensely freeing to know deeply that you are truly in the care of the sovereign God. One writer, in response to all that's been circling around us, picked up on this point, and she wrote this. You can spray your oils, and you can take your vitamin C. You can bathe in Purell, and you can drink all the elderberry you want. And you can feel pretty secure about it all. But 
words. You don't dictate what happens. We are to be wise. But don't dress up your fear in a smug costume of control. We are not in control. We are frail. God loves us in more ways than we can understand. And His love is not dependent upon our understanding of it. But as we know our frailty, we can go to Him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Connected with our frailty is our dependence. We are dependent. We, we've learned that as, as, as all the mad rush on the grocery stores have reminded us in the last few days. We're dependent on a supply chain. We're dependent on, on, on farmers. We're, we're dependent on lumberjacks to cut down the tree and, and to make us all toilet paper. We are more vulnerable than we could all ever imagine. Each moment we live presents countless opportunities to die, not to be grim. But your one aneurysm, your one stroke, your one sleeping or distracted driver away from eternity. And COVID-19 is a reminder that we are ultimately not in control. If we were ultimately in control, certainly we would have eliminated this disease. And while we're at it, we would have eliminated all suffering altogether. But we are not in charge. So the disease remains. The question is not whether you will depend on outside resources or protections. We all do. Everything in this life, though, will eventually fail you. Your health will fail you. Your loved ones will fail you. Sometimes at at no fault of their own. They will all eventually die. The question is, whom will you ultimately trust? We're all resting in something. Ultimately. Or someone. Ultimately. And calamity and turmoil has a way of showing us who or what that really is. You will either trust in princes and chariots or you will trust in the Lord your God. When disaster strikes, it often reveals who was ready and who wasn't. Who had a disaster plan in place? Who had a storage of food and supplies? But it not only reveals who was ready and who wasn't on a material, physical level. It also does in the spiritual. When calamity and hardship strike, does my understanding and my belief in God and who God is, does that work in the time of difficulty and pain as well as it does in times of abundance? One of the blessings of this moment is that it causes our anxieties and our fears and our unsettledness to kind of rise to the surface of our life. It reveals them. Maybe you thought you would have never responded the way you have responded over the last few days. And we do need to remind ourselves that when through the deep waters he he calls us to go, he will make sure that the rivers of sorrow do not overflow and that his grace is sufficient. But it is a reminder that we are frail and we are dependent. We do not find comfort in the odds of not contracting the virus. The world gets its comfort by remaining in zones of minimal risk, by being a part of a demographic that is least affected. Their hope comes from the pandemic staying in somebody else's neighborhood. But that's not where our hope comes from. Some trust in chariots, the CDC, pharmaceutical labs somewhere, somehow producing vaccine. Some trust in horses, their own stockpile of rice and toilet paper and hand sanitizer. 
but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. As the Heidelberg Catechism helpfully puts it, what is your only hope in life and death? My only hope is that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood, and He has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my Heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Indeed, Paul says, we felt the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. This is a moment that we cannot waste. Or the seventh lesson is that the eternal cannot be touched. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Christ said, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves cannot break in and steal. First Peter chapter one, verses three to five, there is a hope, there is an inheritance, there is a salvation that is imperishable, undefiled, kept in heaven for you. Oh, the virus may touch our portfolios. The virus may touch our health. The virus may touch our schedules. And frankly, at some point, the thing that we most fear, a car accident, singleness, Alzheimer's, dengue fever, bankruptcy, it will actually catch up to all of us. Yes, that is at least in this life. But if you know Jesus, if he has redeemed you from slavery to your sin, then we know that eternity is certain and will be better than this life. If you don't know Christ, pulling yourself up, one author wrote, by your own anxious bootstraps will never, never soothe your fear. If you don't know him, then this life is as good as it gets. But you can know him. And nothing else is more important than seeking his redemption. This moment, this virus has taught us that there is more to life than schedules and fleeting pleasures. As you and us all are forced to gather with those Precious to us, may the Lord remind you of the lasting value of the human soul and the fleeting comforts of this world. And victory is not measured by your ability to stay alive. But victory, Paul says, is measured in knowing Christ and Him crucified and Him risen again. For then, and only then, to die is gain. John Piper says, God desires to wean us off the breast of this world and feast us on the sufficiency of Christ. Amen. May we be able to say with Paul, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Well, I want to leave you with a responsibility. We are responsible to act. And it is loving to do so. The great leader, Nehemiah, prayed to God. And he set a guard of protection against the enemies at the same time. Ignoring the threat that is before us and blissfully saying that, hey, God will protect me. That can actually be putting God to the test. We are to respond in godly ways. I was reminded by the dean over at Covenant Christian Academy this past week that there is no contradiction between dependence on God and defensive measures. God expects his people to be wise stewards and using resources to care for people and honor him, whether it is with swords or with soap, end quote. 
So wash your hands. But there are many other ways that we can respond. We don't know if COVID-19 will end up being a minor inconvenience to our stock portfolio or if, a, or if we'll all end up in a quarantine zone somewhere or fall ill or maybe lose a loved one. But we can wait well in the face of our anxiety. And it means taking the danger seriously. Our God takes our lives seriously and our suffering seriously. While we wait, we are not to churn endlessly inside, but act in faith, believing in our good, wise, and sovereign God. So number one, I would say a responsible act is to cast all your anxieties and cares upon the Lord. You are not to live in fear. Corey Ten Boom, the great hero of the faith at the time of World War II, stood in the face of fear in the protection and preservation of life. She once quipped, Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. What a true statement. We are not to be given over to worry. As Christ himself says, Can you change tomorrow by your worry? David Powelson says this, fear is, a protection, fear is a prediction of the future that does not take into account the sovereignty of a good God. End quote. Rather than worrying and being anxious, Jesus calls us to respond with prayer and faith in Him in Matthew 6, 33-34. We're commanded to cast all of our cares upon the Lord in 1 Peter We are commanded to not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make every request known unto God. In Philippians 4, 6. We need not worry ultimately because we know the one who has defeated sin and death. So pray. Pray with your families. Lead your children in times of prayerful dependence on the Lord. We pray until we are bold, and then we act. And it is good to act. I would say another point of application is that it's not good to be alone. As it's appropriate, I would say gather with friends and and family in small groups. We need to continue to study God's Word, to break bread, to, to pray together. And we'll be hearing more about that in the week to come as to how the elders hope to carry out that word of wisdom. We may need to change our practices some. We may need to be a little more vigilant in how we protect against germs and viruses. But to isolate oneself out of fear for extended periods of time is contrary to what God would have for us. Thirdly, I'll say this. Another way to act is don't act exploitively. Exploitatively, I should say but demonstrate ethical and moral modes of action. What do I mean by that? Much of the world will demonstrate an unfortunate impulse to protect themselves at any cost. That's not the Christian. We trust that we can do right and well at the same time. If you have resources and others are in need, then be willing to give it up for the good of others. Don't launch into a lecture of how you were prepared and they weren't. But Christians are called to more than merely ethical action. We must think redemptively as well. We must be willing to make sacrifices that restore what has been broken. We can begin preparing our hearts and our homes, even now to minister to those who may need comfort and resources. This is the way of Christ. Reach out to those who are most vulnerable. The elderly, the sick, the weak. Lend a helping hand. Offer to get groceries for them. Run errands for them. Write a note of encouragement in the midst of grief. Many may be laid off from work in the coming weeks. I would say for those who are more affluent, begin to free up cash in preparation to help those who will need money in our midst and in our congregation. We don't merely need to act to survive, but we want to be instruments of mercy to those in need so that the love of Christ may be widely 
seen. We waste this opportunity if we fail to use it as a witness for Christ. We do not fear as the world does. We do not get wrapped up in the hysteria of the world. We demonstrate that we serve the one who has been victorious over death and has set us free from the fear of death. We have been delivered from lifelong slavery. Like Christ, we love people in their fear. We don't mock them or dismiss their fear. But we are not controlled or overtaken by fear. Not being driven by fear means that we move forward with our calling and our responsibilities, carrying out our duty, even in the face of potential harm, because God is with us. We serve a Savior who led His terrified disciples into Jerusalem and even told them that He was going to send them out as sheep in the midst of wolves. But He would be with them even to the end of the age. God is our refuge, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Oh, brethren, maybe it's fitting to leave you with a sweet word of advice that John Newton gave to his people. Let us suppose the thing that we are most afraid of actually happens. Can it come a moment sooner or in any other way than by his appointment? Is he not gracious and faithful to support us under the stroke? Is he not rich enough to give us something better than ever he will, ev- he will take away? Is not the light of his countenance better than life? and all its most valued enjoyments. But brethren, God is sovereign. And in that sovereignty, He's not opposed to our suffering in moments to accomplish His goodwill, for God is good. Brethren, the Lord is with us. Though we are frail, and though we are dependent, we know that the eternal cannot be touched. And because of those promises, we are responsible to act. And it is loving to do so. May the Lord be with you. As you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself.